Well, good morning and a warm welcome to this online service for Trinity Sunday. We're going to begin by singing our opening hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. to worship the true and living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we first examine our own hearts to confess our sins before God. Please join in with the words, forgive us our sin. Lord God, our maker and our redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and save us. We have willfully misused your gifts of creation. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have condoned evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have not loved you with all our heart, nor our neighbours as ourselves. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. So may Almighty God have mercy upon us, Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. And now Megan Watkins is going to read our Bible reading for us this morning. This reading is taken from Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. The Great Commission. When the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded to you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we come to think about the nature of God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, let's pray for his help. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be our teacher and help us to understand who you truly are, that we may worship you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, a poll carried out a few years ago by the National Centre for Social Research found that for the first time in the United Kingdom, over half of those surveyed said that they had no religion. Some people find this depressing, an indicator of the continued decline of the Christian faith in our nation. Uh, others insist that no religion is not the same as atheism and that younger generations have not necessarily given up believing in God. But what sort of God are we talking about? Many people still believe in a God who started the universe in the first place and has basically left us to get on with it. He's a distant figure, remote and uncaring, a God you'd only pray to in a crisis. The academic uh, Tom Wright uh, once wrote this, quote, it's not surprising that people who believe in the existence of that sort of God don't go to church, except now and then. It's hardly worth getting out of bed for a God like that. He's right, isn't he? The idea of God that many people believe in or refuse to believe in is just that, an idea. It's miles away from the true God revealed to us in the Bible, a God who is real, personal and loving, because he is a trinity of loving persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity has long been an established part of the Christian creeds. But it is a doctrine that has come to be seen as simply too complicated for ordinary Christians uh, to understand. One author says this, quote, For many Christians, the Trinity has become something akin to their appendix. It's there, but they're not sure what its function is, they get by in life without it doing very much, and if they had to have it removed, they wouldn't be too distressed. Now, I suspect that that comment isn't far from the truth for many of us. So that's why on this Trinity Sunday, I'd like to ask three questions to help us think this through. Firstly, is the Trinity biblical? Secondly, is the Trinity believable? And thirdly, is the Trinity relevant? So firstly, is the Trinity biblical? Now it's true that the term Trinity doesn't occur anywhere in the Bible, but that doesn't mean it isn't a biblical idea. It was invented in the early centuries of the Christian church as the best term available to express the nature of God as revealed in the writings of the New Testament. The word Trinity means tri-unity that God is three persons sharing one divine nature. This is the only logical conclusion from the teaching of Jesus himself. So for example, in John chapter eight, verse 42, Jesus says to the Jewish religious leaders, quote, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. And later in John 14, verse 9, he says to Philip, quote, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And again, a little bit later on in John chapter 14, verse 18, 
Speaking of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says this, quote, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. So in all those references, Jesus speaks of a unity between himself, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Such statements do not mean that there are three gods, or that Jesus or the Holy Spirit are just different ways that God chooses to express himself. No, they are three persons, but one God. And this is made crystal clear at the end of Matthew's Gospel, when the risen Jesus says to his disciples in chapter 28, verse 19, quote, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, baptism in the New Testament is not a rite of passage. It's a means of turning back to God and receiving his forgiveness. So who is the one true God that people are to turn back to? What is his name according to Jesus Christ? It is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the triune nature of God is implied by Jesus' teaching and actions in the Gospels. But it's also made explicit by the teaching of his apostles in the New Testament. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, echoes the famous Jewish Shema, the traditional confession that there is only one God. Um, it says this, quote, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Or, a very famous example, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, says this, May the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. This, then, is the God that the early Christians worshipped, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This means that we're not at liberty to invent alternative names for God, as some feminist theologians have done, like Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, which are all, in fact, actions of God in which all three persons of the Trinity share. Neither are we free to rationalise things and say that, well, we just believe in plain old simple God. That's what Unitarians do. No, the real God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Any other definition is a false God, a man-made alternative, an idol. The word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the idea is certainly biblical. So is the Trinity biblical? Secondly, is the Trinity believable? Well, many see the doctrine of the Trinity as the theological equivalent of Sudoku, a mathematical puzzle where we somehow have to prove that 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. But what we're being asked to believe about God is not a mathematical contradiction. The Trinity is a oneness consisting in the inseparable relations of Father, Son, and spirit, all of whom share the same divine nature. After all, doesn't the Bible teach somewhere, something similar? In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, that in marriage a man and a woman become one flesh. One plus one equals one. Now others try to explain the Trinity using everyday analogies. Uh, someone once said to me at a clergy lunch, have you heard the one about the Trinity being like a Jaffa cake? You need the chocolate, the marmalade layer, and the spongy bit, otherwise it's not a Jaffa cake. Another famous analogy is mentioned in the film Nuns on the Run, in which two escaped convicts disguised as nuns find themselves having to teach an RE lesson. And one of them says in desperation, look, all you need to know about the Trinity is this, God is like a shamrock small, green, and split three ways. Class dismissed. But as those examples show, such comparisons always prove inadequate. A Jaffa cake or a three-leaf clover are both one thing with three parts. But the three persons of the Trinity are not three parts of God. They are all fully God. 
So are we being asked to believe something that is simply beyond our grasp? Well, in a sense, yes. A neuroscientist once pointed out that if our brains were simple enough to understand, we'd be too simple to understand them. Similarly, if God was simple enough for us to, to understand, he would be too simple to be God. The Christian writer C.S. Lewis uses a more helpful analogy, I think, to help us understand the Trinity. Um, he says this, quote, on the human level, one person is one being. And any two persons are two separate beings, just as in two dimensions, say on a flat sheet of paper, one square is one figure. And any two squares are two separate figures. On the divine level, you still find personalities, but up there, you find them combined in new ways which we who do not live on that level cannot imagine. In God's dimension, so to speak, you find a being who is three persons while remaining one being, just as a cube is six squares while remaining one cube. Of course, we cannot fully conceive of a being like that, just as if we were so made that we perceived only two dimensions in space, we could never properly imagine a cube. But we can get a faint sort of notion of it. And when we do, we are then, for the first time in our lives, getting some positive idea, however faint, of something super personal, something more than a person. Well, think about it another way. If the greatest thing in human experience is love, and all the great artists and poets and musicians down the ages have agreed on this, then surely it makes sense that the ultimate reality behind life and the universe and everything is a God whose very being consists of three persons in an eternal relationship of self-giving love. No wonder that the Bible says, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, God is love. The Trinity may be strange, but it is not unbelievable. Is the Trinity biblical? Is it believable? And thirdly, is the Trinity relevant? Well, Thomas Jefferson once said that the doctrine of the Trinity has no practical relevance. I beg to disagree. Here are three brief practical implications which show that the Trinity is good news. Firstly, only through the Trinity can we know God. Why? Well, since God is infinite, our finite minds cannot know him through our own reasoning or cleverness. And because we are sinful, our minds suppress the truth about God because we don't want him to be God over us. But the Trinitarian nature of God means we can know him truly and personally. How? Because God the Father reveals himself in history in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ, so that our finite minds can understand him. And the Father sends his Holy Spirit to us so that instead of rejecting Jesus, we see the reality of God in him and put our trust in him. So 1 John chapter 4 verse 15 puts it like this, if anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the son of God, God lives in them and they in God. Wow. Second practical implication is that only through the Trinity can we be reconciled with God? Why? Well, if God is good and loving, then he must punish evil, selfishness, and wrongdoing. The problem is that all of us are guilty of those things. So how can God forgive us and still be fair and just? Only because he is a trinity of loving persons. In love, God the Father sent his son Jesus to become a man and willingly die in our place on a cross. He took the punishment our sins deserve and was forsaken by his Father, so we might never have to be. The Holy Spirit then applies the forgiveness of God 
to our hearts so we know we're fully loved and accepted by him. Only belief in the Trinity can deal with our guilt. And thirdly, only through the Trinity can we learn to become truly human. Why? Well, most societies emphasise either the supreme importance of the individual, like Western culture, or the supreme importance of the community, like traditional cultures. But both tendencies end up making us less human. How? Well, individualism denies the fact that our true identity is found through our relationships with others. And communal cultures often end up suppressing the diversity of individuals for the greater good. So how can we learn how to respect both individual diversity and foster genuine relationships of self-giving love? Only through the God who is unity in diversity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And where can we find people who model their relationships on this God? In the local church. Diverse people united in self-giving love. Well, many people today think of God as distant, impersonal, and uncaring. But this is not the real God. The real God is the God who has drawn near to us in the person of Jesus, his Son, who comes to live within us by his Holy Spirit, and who draws us to himself as our own loving Heavenly Father. The God who is Trinity is here, he is personal, he is real, and he cares deeply about us. Let us worship him alone and accept no substitutes. Amen. We're going to pray now and I'm going to use the collect for Trinity Sunday. So let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your servant's grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith, that we may evermore be defended from all adversities, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to continue in prayer now, and Anthony Wells is going to lead us in our prayers of intercession. Let us begin our prayers on this Trinity Sunday by thanking God that he has revealed himself to us in such a wonderfully personal way and in a way that we cannot fail to notice. In his glorious majesty and perfect love, he comes alongside us as three persons in one perfect trinity. It is the Holy Spirit who as counsellor takes up residence in our hearts and draws us to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who in turn not only shows us how to worship and pray to the Father, but by his work on the cross enables us to come to the Father with clean hearts and solid assurance of faith and forgiveness. And it was this same Father who sent his one and only Son into the world in the first place, that we, his followers, might live through him and so understand this extraordinary act of love in person. So today we pray that we may be held as children of faith and that we may know God in all his ways and evermore rejoice in his eternal glory. Three persons and yet one God, now and forever. Amen. We now turn our hearts to the world and to the sad events particularly in America for this second prayer. We've heard this week how black lives matter. How much racial disharmony must hurt the loving heart of the Trinity. Let us pray for a change of heart, not only in America, but in our own country as well. 
O God and Father of us all, who made of one blood all nations and men and women to dwell on the face of the earth, deepen our understandings of peoples of other races, languages and customs that differ, differ from our own. Teach us to view them in the light of your, your own all-embracing love and creative purpose. And give us a vision of the true brotherhood of mankind, united under one Father. Have mercy particularly on the United States of America at this time, and drive its leaders to dialogue and understanding of the wrongs that need to be righted in that sad country. May the Holy Spirit inspire healing and forgiveness and strengthen the churches to be in the forefront of reconciliation. We ask this in the name of our Saviour, who died that all races of mankind might be one. Amen. Now as we come back to this country, let us now pray for all the staff of the NHS and the frontline care workers who we have admired so much these past weeks. Lord Jesus Christ, who in the days of your life on earth showed compassion to the sick and afflicted and made them whole, come alongside, we pray, all the frontline workers in our hospitals and in our care homes who must be exhausted by this pandemic. Keep them well away, keep them well, well we pray, and give them empathy and skill, and especially with the dying. May your presence be at hand to help in every situation, and particularly for those whose earthly life is drawing to a close. Relieve all distress, remove fear, and bring peace at the last to the afflicted. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Finally, we pray for the countries of the world and its leaders, most of whom are at full stretch at this time. O Lord our God, let us pray that, our, that your Holy Spirit may rest upon all who bear responsibility for government among the nations, especially our own. Give them wisdom, courage and strength, especially in the light of this epidemic, that they may make and maintain order and lasting peace, and that the world may pull together in a quest for healing without fear to the glory of your holy name. Amen. So this closing prayer. Heavenly Father, graciously receive these our prayers whether spoken or echoed in our heart, and answer them as may be best for us and for those for whom we have prayed, for the sake of thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we continue with the Lord's Prayer, and I shall pray it in the Old Version. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We thought about uh, one of the practical implications uh, of believing in the Trinity is that we can know God's forgiveness uh, of our guilt through Jesus' death on the cross. And our closing hymn uh, celebrates that amazing love, how deep the Father's love for us.
so we come to our final blessing. May God, the Holy Trinity, make us strong in faith and love, defend us on every side, and guide us in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always.